Hello, this is Susan Bird, and you are listening to the Curated Conversations podcasts. In this series, East Meets West and Vice Versa, we're exploring the new conversations taking place in and between Asia and the West on a variety of subjects. With me today is Simon Khan, Chief Marketing Officer for Asia Pacific and for Google. Simon moved to Singapore seven years ago from New York. And from there, he has spent time throughout the Asia-Pacific region, where he has been witness to a total reimagining of the marketing playbook over the past few years. Simon grew up in the United States, in North Carolina, and had an early interest in Asia, which meant that in college he studied Asian studies, received his BA in that subject from Swarthmore College in the U.S., and a master's in Chinese studies and an MBA from the University of Michigan. Not surprisingly, Simon speaks both English and Mandarin. I met Simon about a year and a half ago in Singapore, and I was so impressed by his global perspective and his understanding of both Western and Asian culture that I'm just delighted he can join us today. He is joining us from Singapore. Welcome to Curated Conversations, Simon. Thanks very much. Great to be here. So my first question of you is when we talk about the conversations taking place in and between Asia and the West, just what does that bring to mind for you? What does that mean? Well, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting concept. I, what it really, to me, is, is, is indicating is that really conversations are happening, and it's a dialogue that's going in, in two directions. And I think um, for a lot of uh, Western companies or multinationals, Historically, I think they've thought about kind of just it, conversations only really happening from the West um, to Asia. Um, but we are certainly seeing incredible innovation happening in this part of the world, and we're seeing changes in consumer behavior that are starting first in Asia and then um, flowing into the United States and Europe. So more and more, I think uh, companies are starting to listen to and actively engage in dialogue with uh, consumers in Asia and with, you know, business partners, because there's so much opportunity in this part of the world and so much to learn. So it's really turned from talk to conversation, from a one-way transfer of information or telling people what you think to really engaging with them. Is that what you'd say? That, that's absolutely right. And, it, and I think it, um, it reflects a shift in kind of the relative economic status of this part of the world. Uh, Middle-class incomes are rising in virtually every market here. Um, you've got, uh, you know, in, in infrastructure improvements that are dramatic. Uh, so, for example, if you think about Vietnam, Vietnam currently has the same level of smartphone penetration as the United States, and their Internet speeds are about uh, – two-thirds to 75 percent of the speeds of the United States. So we're seeing, um, you know, it, the ability for consumers in this part of the world to access products, the, the same sort of products that you would have in, in Europe and the U.S., but they're doing it in very different ways, and that's creating some really interesting opportunities for, for Western multinationals. So what are those different ways? Is it that they skip the real estate, don't have to go into stores and do it online, or is there something else? Uh, a few things. So, so one is that, in particularly in emerging markets, they've fundamentally skipped uh, desktops, right? So everything's happening on mobile phones. And in markets like uh, India, they'll add something like, you know, 40 to 50 million new Internet users, and virtually all of them will experience the Internet for the first time uh, using a mobile phone. So they'll add those in just a year, 40 to 50 million people. Uh, so – the people are, are expecting that they can get the information and have the services that they want on their phone, and they do, and the technology is, is so much greater. Um, so skipping over laptops, I think, has, has been an interesting one. Um, in markets like China in particular, you see really innovative m-commerce and e-commerce uh, use cases. So you've, you've got companies like you know, WeChat uh, that are doing very interesting things to um, you know, make it much easier for consumers to buy products both in the, in the real world and the, in the virtual world. So I remember you telling me at one point when we talked some time ago, you said Asia is moving from a mobile first world to a mobile only world. What did you mean by that? 
that, that that's I mean exactly um, the, the point around uh, skipping really desktops, and that um, there's an expectation that whether it's for personal consumption or increasingly for work, that um, individuals are just using their mobile phone, and companies in this part of the world are um, designing their products and services to work efficiently on mobile because it's not seen as either a secondary option or maybe a choice, but it's the only way they will be connecting with consumers as we move forward. I remember you telling me that in Singapore, the Singaporeans reach for their phones 150 times a day. Now that was a year and a half ago. Maybe they're reaching for it even more, but that just blew me away. Just they're living on Yeah, it. and that's... Um, I'm sorry, that's that's a statistic that's really true. I think um, throughout the throughout Asia, uh, and and you know, it's first thing in the morning you reach for your phone, and that continues throughout the day. Uh, and it, it's an interesting uh, behavior because it's a mix of what we would all do around the world: check the time, check email, um, maybe look at your social networks to to see what's happening with your friends and family. But what you're also seeing is is something uh, we call micro moments. And these are moments where consumers have an intent to do something. So, for example, you may be in a new city and you're looking for the nearest coffee shop. So increasingly, if somebody, you know, as you're walking down the street, you look for, to your phone for that information. And one of the things we talk to our, our business partners about is if you want to be um, in the mix to be able to con convert that person to a customer to your coffee shop, you need to be advertising in that micro moment, in that moment that matters to the customer. Um, and you're seeing this really across a variety of, of different types of, of products and verticals. Um, but uh, this is an example of where, uh, you know, phones are going beyond just a communications meme um, or, you know, a fancy camera to something that's just a real tool that people use all throughout the day. I think you also, I think it was you who told me that in Indonesia, 61% of online users use their smartphone to make a purchase, which you compared to only 10% in the U.S. Is it, did I get that right? Um, I'm not sure of the exact number these days for Indonesia, but generally what you're seeing in a number of markets, including uh, sort of um, less developed markets, um, you're seeing a, a pretty high percentage of um, m-commerce happening or e-commerce happening. And, and, you know, part of what's happening in markets like Indonesia is that because they have relatively lower uh, penetration rates, um, it's the wealthier segment that currently has smartphones and currently can do that. So you're seeing a higher percentage of them, um, you know, go ahead and, and make purchases online or on their phones. Wow. So things are really growing apace. It sounds like you're, you're, you're still extremely bullish about the whole Asian area. So it, talk to me about what's on the, what is now on the mind of many people who have an interest in China, and that is this recent slowdown in the Chinese economy. Is there an impact from that on what you're up to, what Google is doing, what your clients are up to? What it, is it having an impact on your business? Well, I, I think the slowdown in China, it, you know, given how massive the Chinese economy is and how important it is, particularly to uh, markets in Asia, the slowdown is impacting everyone. Um, and they're impacting, it's impacting different businesses and, and different industries in different ways. Obviously, commodities have probably been the hardest hit by the, by the slowdown. Um, you know, I think what's an interesting thing that's happening in China is this rebalancing of, of their economy to become increasingly driven by domestic demand. Uh, and that's, that's a good thing for them, to have a healthier balance between that and export. We certainly, um, you know, in, in many ways, we're in, in good shape because we work with Chinese companies who want to advertise to the rest of the world. And we're helping Chinese companies, large and small, um, get, you know, search ads or, or display ads in markets like Australia, Singapore, uh, the United States, to, to export their products. So generally, I wouldn't say that, that this is it, it having a significant impact um, on us, but you know, we're, we're all very aware of, of the slowdown and what the knock-on effect will be to companies um, around the region. So how about individuals? We know that people born in the last 30 years in China have been living in a country where growth has been exponential and it's the only thing they've known. 
um, from what I read and I hear from some people that the mood of the middle class is one that's now somewhat fearful, which was not true some years ago. Is, is that, is that the case if you know that? And, and is it reflected in other countries of Asia Pacific? Um, I think that, so I don't, I don't have data that is, will specifically support our, our, um, kind of knock that, that argument. My sense is that there is a greater sense of angst, um, because there are, there's just a larger middle class now and, and more people are more invested in, in general, what's happening with the economy. Um, but, you know, I, Honestly, I think that uh, the biggest thing that's happened is that there's been this kind of incredibly fast growth over the last 20 to 30 years. And as it's as the economy is taking a breather, uh, people who aren't used to that um, are, are starting to, to get nervous. But you have to remember there's still a fairly significant um, part of the population in China who has gone through really extremely difficult circumstances in the past. And, and this is nothing compared to what they may have gone through in the 70s, as an example. Uh, so I, I think in some ways it's a, it's a bit overblown and it's a bit more um, of a sense of general angst that, that anyone has if you're going through a slowing in, in, in your economy. Now, you mentioned, and I thought it was, it was fascinating when you said that one of the differences in, in the conversation, however we define that, is that now – there's a two-way exchange and there's a tremendous amount of innovation that in fact is coming from that part of the world and, and having an impact elsewhere. So uh, I'd be curious to know your thought as to do Asians view innovations differently than the West? I remember your definition was that it's a process that improves upon whatever metrics exist. It doesn't have to be disruptive, but needs to result in some kind of material change in what happened before. Um, where does that all stand? Is that the same kind of innovation you're talking about, or is there more disruptive kind of stuff happening as well? Well, I, I think the definition, the innovation definition, it pretty much is consistent really anywhere around the world. Um, it's What I would say is that uh, what's happening in, in a number of markets in Asia is that um, people are reacting to the circumstances within their market or within their, their sub-region and are finding ways to be successful, um, you know, to make more money, to uh, get, a, get a company up and running. Uh, and probably one of the greatest changes that we have seen in the last few years is that uh, companies or, or individuals in this part of the world are not necessarily going the kind of the safe route and joining established firms or trying to make money in, in manufacturing or in uh, real estate, but are looking to expand out of that. So in some ways, that's probably the most disruptive change that's happening. You, know, um, you think about Alibaba or Tencent. Uh, these are companies that didn't exist you know, 20 years ago and are now powerhouses. Um, and part of the reason that they're powerhouses is, is they understand very clearly what's happening within their market, within China, and have um, developed – you might even say workaround solutions, but they are frankly innovations and sometimes fairly disruptive innovations that um, really work for that market. One of the key questions I think going forward is can these sorts of companies who have been so successful in their home markets, can they break out and can they replicate that success once they get out of um, you know, markets that they really know? Do you have a thought about that? Is the jury still out? I think the jury's out. I think that, you know, they, they certainly have an ambition to do so. Um, incredibly talented people. Increasingly, they're hiring people who have experience working in the West, have experience working in um, multinational organizations. So they're smart about figuring out how to bring in the right uh, talent to, to help make this happen. Um, but, you know, I don't think we've seen really any significant examples of where they've been um, very, very successful once they've broken out of their home market. So how about the importance of innovation to Singapore? I, I remember hearing that, and I think, I think you had said, that Singapore has a good shot at being Asia's hub for innovation. Is that still true, and what would that mean? I, absolutely. I mean, I think that, that Singapore, um, for its last 51 years of its existence, has consistently punched above its weight um, because I think they take a very pragmatic 
view of their place in the, in the world and certainly in Asia. And they understand that it's a small market um, with really no natural resources, and they have to rely on the talents of their people and the organization of, of the government and the economy here in order to be successful. So, you know, the government historically has done a very good job of, of planning 10 to 15 years ahead and thinking about ways to um, innovate um, within within its processes and its economy. And, I, and you certainly see that uh, continuing to happen. Um, the whole Smart Nation initiative, uh, which is to, you know, fundamentally transform um, connectivity in the, in the market um, to ensure that there's greater access for um, both its citizens as well as companies that are operating here to a great infrastructure, whether that's uh, web infrastructure or physical, um, you know, even considering things like driverless buses and cars, all of these things are sort of happening here and being led by some very thoughtful planning about what the next 10 to 15 years will look like uh, for Singapore. So I know you've also said that Singapore is an island of stability, so it's easy to attract talent. Will the, will the young who are educated in the West return and eventually lead companies? Is that where some of that innovation is going to come from? Um, yeah, but I would say that Singapore doesn't have, just because it doesn't have a lot of people, it doesn't have a huge um, population that's, that's outside that will come back. I mean, there are certainly Singaporeans who study abroad and, and do come back and, and are successful. I think where you'll see that impact be on a much greater scale is in other markets in Southeast Asia and, you know, and certainly in China. Um, when you look at the number of students that are studying abroad from China, it's massive. And um, those students will come back. Not all of them, obviously, will lead companies or found companies. But probably more importantly, they will, they will go into the senior and the middle management of, of these companies and start to change business practices there, which will start to look more Western in nature. So one of the reasons there are so many Chinese, at least, going, from uh, c coming to schools in the West, both in the UK and in the United States, is because um, people there feel that the educational system is one based so much on rote learning that it doesn't foster the kind of critical thinking that that uh, a number of parents wish for their children and that students, once they reach the college age, are eager to get themselves. Is that true of Singapore as well? Is the educational system uh, similarly uh, uh, not so prone to critical thinking teaching? I, my sense is that it's really quite a good educational system. What's, what's the comparison there? Yeah, it's, it's actually, it's an excellent educational system, but the Singaporean system is very similar to most of the systems that you find in Asia, which is a greater degree of emphasis on rote learning, um, on sort of instruction from teacher, don't ask questions, right? So that's, that's, that's an extreme um, kind of uh, view of it. But what, what's impressive is that the Singapore government and the ed educational establishment here uh, acknowledge this and acknowledge that they need to transition uh, to more of a flexible uh, learning mode that, that does focus more on creative thinking, uh, and, and they're in that process of doing it. But, you know, it does, it does take a while to, to shift these sorts of practices. Uh, but I think that Singapore is probably further ahead than any other market in the region in, in tackling this problem. So one of the people say that one of the drivers of Western innovative success has been the tendency to question authority, to be skeptical, and dissent. Will Singapore find a way to circumvent the fact that there is a natural deference to authority and that might, in fact, mean that it is less prone to be highly innovative, or is that really not, a, not at all true? Well, I, I, I guess the, what we're seeing in terms of the success and innovation that's happening in a number of markets in Asia, uh, which now more and more Western companies are starting to pay attention to, would say that, that that view isn't necessarily true, that you can be quite innovative in, in countries that have um, you kind of a dimmer view of dissent. Um, so if, certainly if you look at China, right, I mean, there's incredible innovation that's happening there, and that's not a market that's known for robust um, open debate. Um, so I think the you know, the question is, what are all of the factors that you need in order to create an environment that will foster innovation? And um, one of those factors is 
is you know thinking about um, how do you ch how do you challenge the accepted practice, um, challenge the the status quo, and you know I think you're seeing that more and more happening in markets like Singapore, but it's not necessarily done from a political standpoint. It's more of, of challenging uh, business practices, um, challenging accepted norms about how you go into markets or even what markets you go into. And, and I think that's where you're, you'll start to see um, very different types of innovation happening in this part of the world. That's impressive because it means that that can coexist with, um, with a very different political system and, and get along just fine. At least that, that, that's what I would assume having hearing you say that. Now, what about privacy issues? You know, in the West, we've gotten so excited about people getting access to our data and we want to have everything to ourselves and yet somehow we seem to find that people like to put pictures of themselves all over the place but there is this there is this sense that um, people want to maintain all their own data is that so true in in Asia my sense is it's not yeah I, I think generally um, the norms around privacy and are different, and 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 there is a um, a lesser degree of expectation that your data will be private, um, or that you you have the right to control all of that information. Um, I, I do think it's starting to to change a bit, and we're seeing um, more and more discussion happening, you know, within the regulatory bodies, or even just in general with with people um, in in media starting to talk about privacy concerns. Um, and, and maybe that's a reflection of just greater exposure to these privacy debates that are happening in other parts of the world. But certainly that, that norm around privacy that you're seeing, particularly in Europe, is not the case here in Asia. So it sounds as if you're pretty bullish about this whole part of the world and the opportunities there. What, what is your biggest source of optimism about Asia Pacific's future? What has you so excited about it? Ah, there's so many, so many things. I mean, one is that it's an incredibly young part of the world. You know, with the with the big exceptions, obviously, of China and Japan, which which have uh, significantly Asian populations. If you look at Southeast Asia, you look at India. Um, these are markets that have uh, you know median ages of around 30. Um, or in some markets, you'll see that you know roughly 40 percent of the people are under the age of 25. Uh, so there's a lot of upside potential here. I think there's a huge degree of sort of optimism and entrepreneurial spirit that you see in virtually any of these markets. Um, there's just this sense of, you know, we've been through downturns, we've been through crises, and we bounce back quickly, and we and we make things happen. Um, so that that is an environment which you know makes it much easier to to you know operate and to be successful. And then I'd, I'd say that. Um, as incomes are, are rising, you know, as the middle class is growing in so many of these markets and as educational levels are, are growing, um, these are just the, the right elements that foster growth in businesses and certainly foster growth in consumption. So uh, whether you're, you know, uh, a media company or you're selling physical goods, there's an opportunity uh, to, to grow your business in this part of the world because income, uh, incomes are, are growing. So what are the major challenges? What, what can get in the way of this rosy future? Well, I think, um, you know, one of the challenges, and particularly in markets like China, uh, it is the environment. You know, just, you know, they've made a conscious decision uh, in, in years past to focus on heavily polluting industries in order to continue to their, their, in, their growth engine. Um, and that, that is impacting, you know, people's health, it's impacting the standard of living, and then as uh, folks move into the middle class, they're feeling that more and more, and they're being more and more vocal about um, you know, challenges to the quality of life. So uh, Ch China, I think, you know, is, is starting to address these things in a pretty significant way, but they've got a long way to go uh, before you see a really kind of robust um, environment picture. And, and I think that's going to impact you know, not only China, but another, a number of other markets around here who will try to move up through um, industrialization. So I'd say that's one. Uh, the second is, is just political instability. And, you know, there are a number of um, potential flashpoints throughout the region that, 
any one of which could cause a um, you know a slowdown in in economic output because uh, the governments are going to have to deal with this. And I think that's something that we we always have to be mindful of in in this part of the world. So those are the two biggest I would I would look to. Simon, are there other issues that you'd mention regarding the East meets West um, whole phenomenon? Anything that you find particularly interesting that we haven't mentioned? Well, I, I think that with regard to kind of the, the conversation, the dialogue that's now happening between East and West, one of the major things that needs to happen is that, you know, folks in the United States or in Europe need to acknowledge that there is a great deal of innovation uh, happening from Asia and that uh, Asia in, in many ways should be the place that people look to in order to understand what the future will be. And that's a, in many ways, a mind shift for um, a lot of folks. And, and certainly when I speak to people in the United States, uh, you know, they're not aware of even where certain countries are, quite honestly. And they're certainly not aware of the geopolitical situation, um, and they're not, they're not, they don't have a good sense of the pace of development that's happening here. And if you look at, for example, here in Singapore, you know, the infrastructure in Singapore, um, the way things are designed here, uh, it, it's much, much better than many parts of the United States, quite honestly. And that, that's a shock uh, when I tell folks in the United States. Uh, you know, Westerners, and particularly I'd say folks in the United States, uh, need to become much more aware of what's happening in this part of the world because increasingly Asia is going to be a very important force in, in economic growth and in just general developments of, of what will happen around the world. You're, you're certainly reflecting what I see, too, that there is an absence of a real sense of being global citizens. And um, it's, it's surprising, especially once one has spent some time in Asia, to, to return to the United States and, 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 and to Western Europe. But I think principally, as you say, the U.S. and realize that people really do not, do not um, uh, know what's happening and don't appreciate the, the real advancements that have been made. What do, you, what do you think the solution for that is? How do we get Americans, certainly, to get more knowledgeable about this? Well, I think one solution is, is your podcast series. I think this is a great idea to sort of highlight, um, you know, the, these sorts of conversations. Um, yeah, I, I think that I, it's a good question. I don't really have a, a good solution. You know, the um, more... Americans need to have more on-the-ground exposure to what's happening in Asia. And, you know, a, a, a one-week vacation year is, is fine, but um, I think it really takes having people live and work in this region. And one of the things that would be quite helpful, I think, for American multinationals is to have more of their executives based in this part of the world. So the traditional model has been you know, you've got headquarters in the United States, and then your first big office is probably someplace like London. Um, and you rarely actually put any of your senior people in markets in Asia. And I think that would, would have a dramatic impact if you started to put senior people in, uh, in this part of the world. And make sure that those senior people really have an appreciation for what it is they're going into so they don't uh, expect it to be a little America. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is fascinating. Well, thank you, Simon. It's been a delight to share your perspectives. Simon Khan is Chief Marketing Officer for Asia Pacific for Google. He moved to Singapore seven years ago from New York and from there has spent time throughout the Asia Pacific region where he has been witness to a total reimagining of the marketing playbook over the past few years. Simon had an early interest in Asia and received his BA in Asian Studies from Swarthmore College here in the U.S and a master's in Chinese studies and an MBA from the University of Michigan. Simon speaks both English and Mandarin and joined us today from Singapore for this session of the East Meets West and Vice Versa series on Curated Conversations. I'm Susan Bird.